Did that work? Doesn't look like it worked. Does it? Oh. Oh, it says it's recording. There we go. It's all you, Kevin. Okay. All right. So, uh, Sorry, we lost audio. I, I, I will be the only one on it. Okay, my name is Kevin. I am a PhD student here at GW where I study with Dr. Robert Pless and we do mostly computer vision work, but we've been working a lot more into the language space. Uh, in part, thanks to, thanks to our colleagues like Grady who do a lot of interesting language. Oh. Research. <laughs> <laughs> so the project that I'm going to share with you guys today is a recent project that we just uh, submitted to Triple AI. It's called Will Clip Zero Shot, and it basically is about predicting how well the clip model, which I'll get into shortly, can predict uh, zero shot performance of any query, essentially. So from a high level, it's how does AI understand a topic? Go ahead, push What is triple AI? Triple AI is, oh man, I wish I could remember what it stood for. <laughs> it's a conference. It's, a, it's like a big AI conference. Um, I think it's American Association for oh, Artificial AI. Intelligence. That sounds right. <laughs> Something like that. But great call out. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me get into uh, what this project is about. Don't worry if you don't know what clip and zero shot are necessarily. I actually do explain them uh, to give like background on the research. Okay, so let's start from a base point that everyone knows. So this is ChatGPT. Everyone knows how ChatGPT works. Maybe you don't know that you can now you can now give uh, text and images as input. But this is essentially what that is. So essentially, all I've done is I've given a text and image input to ChatGPT and asked it, what's this a picture of? This is a, just a famous painting that I really like. Uh, and it manages to recognize it. It knows exactly what it is. And it's able to describe the scene in the picture. So the obvious question would be, how is this happening? How does it do this? You could maybe make some logical leaps and say maybe it does some sort of reverse image lookup on this image it knows it's seen this image before and it's training because it's a famous painting and the description of the painting maybe is just taken from some sort of website that has lots of information about the painting maybe but then i show another example of a different painting so this one <laughs> is definitely not in the training data because my wife made it yesterday. So what this shows is that I can feed a picture into ChatGPT and it actually is capable of understanding that there are visual features here that it can pick out and explain back to us that it is noticed. So it says it understands it's a cartoon drawing of a panda. It's noticed the trademark panda, white and black with the ears, the spawn on its belly, and also is very aware that it's a sunny day, but the panda is holding an umbrella. It can deduce all of that just from the visual features of this picture. So that gets you to the next like interesting question, which is how can an LLM learn these visual features? So here's where I introduce the concept of multimodal AI. In what we understand as a uh, unimodal AI, which is like the original ChatGPT. It's a singular model that takes one mode of data, that mode of data being text. So in a unimodal generative AI model, you will have one mode of text, uh, one mode of data like text as an input. It generates some sort of output, but it's the same mode of data. So we move to multimodal AI, in which you can train a model on multiple modes of data and it can understand all of them simultaneously. So in this example here, you can see that we have an input of a picture of a horse, a text about a horse, and write a song about a horse. And go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. If you want me to stop, I'll... No, no, you can ask questions, it's fine. So is it, at this point, is it not a large language model anymore? So the thing about a large language model is it is a language model primarily, mm -hmm. but 
it has a like so a, a large like clip esque multimodal model has a lot of the features of a large language model in that it can it can spit out like upcoming or most likely text the same way a large language model could. But it also is a capable of understanding another mode of data as well, which is images in this case. So we see that it's pre-trained with all the data from the different modes. And it can also decode that data from the generative model into the uh, types of modes that it can take as inputs too. So it can generate an image, it can generate text output, and it can generate, in this case, audio output as well. So that's an example of how multimodal AI works. So what is the multimodal AI that ChatGPT is using to understand the picture that I drew here? So here's where I introduce Clip. Clip is a multimodal contrastive learning model that can that was trained on both pairs of images and text and created a shared vector space for both of them that allows for really crazy things such as zero shot mm -hmm. classification, which I will get into shortly. The way that it actually functions here is uh, this matrix here is done in huge batches and Clip is essentially trained on 400 million pairs of images with their captions. So for example, you see the picture of this puppy here. This caption, the caption for this puppy picture was Pepper the Aussie Puppy. So the text, the text encoder, which is some transformer-based architecture, the same as an LLM, will encode the captions into some sort of uh, vector embedding and the same will be done with the image encoder and then contrastive learning is about maximizing this diagonal that you see here so by maximizing this diagonal we end up pushing things into the same shared space nearer to each other and we also are pushing all the things that are not on this diagonal further and further away so what you end up with is a space in which pepper the aussie pu puppy and this picture are as close together as can be, while everything that is not Pepper the Aussie Puppy or a picture of Pepper the Aussie Puppy is pushed as far away as possible in order to differentiate them. And that's why it's contrastive learning. Uh, so what you can do with that information is you can then use different modes of data for classification. So you can take a new picture and you can say, okay, this is a picture here based on its visual features the the text of the uh, image embedding, take these text embeddings and find which one it is most likely to be. And I'll explain how that's done shortly. So what Clip ends up creating, as I said, is this latent vector space. So this is a simplified, uh, I'm not sure if the camera is like, oh no, it's not cutting off, it's fine. Um, what it's doing is it's creating this uh, shared vector space between text and images. As you can see, uh, the orange dots are text and the blue dots are images. And so when you see this simple sketch of a puppy, this is essentially as close to the actual text, a simple sketch of a puppy, as the image can be. And what ends up happening is these similar ideas are clustered into the same places. And as they change, their vectors change as well. And it changes the direction of their vectors, meaning that you create a space in which nearby uh, concepts are similar to each other, and whereas further away concepts have less to do with each other. So as you can see, this whole space circled here could be the space in which most dog image and text vectors live. And you can highlight that area in clip space. However, this is a very simplified version of what clip space is because as you'd see, this is a two dimensional projection of what clip space looks like and the actual vectors are 512 dimensions. So it's a much more complex topic than simply saying, all right, this is right next to this thing, therefore they're the same topic. It actually takes a lot in 512 dimensions for things to be all that similar to one another. So how do we tell that things are similar to each other? So 
one intuitive idea would be to look at the distance between two points and say, okay, the, the X distance between these two points in 512 dimensions, however far away from each other is their similarity. However, in a huge 512 dimensional space, the distance and the difference between the distances could vary a ton. And as it scales up, it only gets more complicated. But if you look at something like a cosine similarity, cosine similarity is actually measuring the direction of vectors rather than distance between two things. So what we can find is that the direction that the dog vector is pointing is very similar for any variation of dog. So a, you know, whether it be a pit bull or a boxer or a chihuahua, they should still be pointing in whatever direction most of the dogs are pointing. And so that's a good way to find similarity between any, any items. And so when you plot it out, when you plot out points in clip space, you find these interesting relationships through cosine similarity. For example, in this image here, you can see that the uh, embedded audio feature of meow is really close to the embedded image feature to a uh, cat. So those are pointing in similar directions, whereas they're much further from the image and audio embeddings for dog. So, yes. So like you said, images are 512 within clip, like the, their dimensions. Yes. Does it have to be, because like, do they have to be in the same dimension space or can like, yes. you have- Yes, everything is in the same space. So you bring the language model down to 512 if it was a higher dimension or up or yes. whatever. So yes, essentially, yeah. So everything is a shared vector space. space of the same size. Okay, thanks. So by using cosine similarity, we can tell what items are, what vectors are close to each other or rather point in the same direction, meaning they have similar meaning. Uh, and so now we can take another look at clip space. So when I say when I say I evaluate local clip space, what I mean is that I can take a representation of a like image or text embedding, and we kind of break down the relevant features based on the directions they are pointing. So the features of a bird embedding may have an interesting feature vectors for beaks and wings and feathers and tails. And that representation is the essentially the embedding. And when that representation changes, AKA the beak, wings, feathers, tail, whatever is different, then it actually shifts where that vector is pointing in clip space, meaning it goes to a different place. So if you're looking at a point that is a Kentucky warbler, for example, and you want to see what happens when you actually start looking at a prothonotary warbler, which has slightly different features, you'll notice that they are in similar clip space, but there is a definite shift. And what you're seeing here in this image is what those changes look like projected into both the text space and the image space. So a logical question might be, why are they not in the same place? The whole point of training is to put them in the same place. However, in reality, when you take a text, a simple text embedding, like a picture of a Kentucky warbler, the actual information that gets encoded into that text vector is a lot less than you would get out of a, an actual picture. So when you take a picture of a Kentucky warbler, what you get is all of the visual features of that Kentucky warbler, the background, and you know, it's like a picture, a picture is a thousand words, right? So what you end up with is what's called this modality gap, which means that there is a gap in clip space between where all the text embeddings usually live and where all the image embeddings usually live. And while they are clustered near each other, there is a separation between image and text embeddings. So we can and should evaluate them kind of in an isolated way. And I'll get into what that means later. So, I wanted to give just very briefly, this just kind of reiterates why this vector space is really cool. Uh, if you were to, if you say you wanted to plot the results of, let's say a pet classification system, and you were to do it with a neural network uh, without using any of maybe newer high level introspective tools that I don't want to get into right now, you would end up with this black box neural network that spits out cat, 
dog, or other, and just a basic likelihood. Whereas if you were to plot it out using clip space, you could actually find interesting things about the uh, about the different vectors from where they are. So as you can see here, there's this uh, dog, cat, and bird embeddings. And so what that what we start finding as we plot more things is that these furrier pets are or furrier animals are pushing more in this vertical direction, whereas different pets that are not furry might be pushing in this other direction. This is again plotted in two dimensions. What that means is that you can start making interesting, like kind of deductive jumps and assumptions about where other things might live. So if this is the furry direction and that there are more furrier animals this way, you might expect like a bear to go up here because a bear is pretty far from the direction of pets, but it's much more in the direction of a furry animal. Whereas you might expect something like a lizard to live here, pushing toward the pet direction, but much further from furry, if that makes sense. And so I wanted to cover that because it kind of just makes a statement about what you can learn explainability wise from vector spaces. So now I'll explain what zero shot learning is. So zero shot learning is essentially the ability of a model to make predictions or classi classify categories of an object based on uh, zero training data. So that means that the model does not have to have seen this train the any training data of something that you're classifying before actually classifying it. How does that make sense? So in a model like um, clip, you you can have an example where you want to classify zebras. However, what if the model has never seen a zebra before? Well, using zero shot classification, you can combine the ideas of the features of of horse and the ideas of the features of stripes to say, well, a zebra is a striped horse or a horse with black and white stripes. Now you've given the model an understanding of what it is based on that text input, and it can now, with reasonable certainty, classify any horse with stripes picture. And that's essentially a zebra a zero shot zebra classifier. So if I go back to this clip image, you can see that what's happening here is we are taking an image, encoding that image, and then comparing it to the matrix of text embeddings. So those text embeddings are the different things we might want to be classifying. So we basically do cosine similarity based on the different text embeddings, and we find which one is the highest. And that highest one is what we're what essentially the closest thing to what we're classifying. So if you take bird, car, dog, plane, and you compare their text embedding to the image embedding of this picture, what you'll end up with is the cosine similarity of this image and dog is highest, meaning this is most likely an image of a dog. So why does zero shot learning matter? Well, because CLIP can do zero shot classification, it can now classify almost any class you can think of. As long as you can describe the class in text, you can use you can essentially zero shot any singular class uh, and even a large cluster of different classes. And what's crazy about this is that it performs very well. So this is the performance chart of zero, zero shot clip training versus few shot learning on different models. Uh, what you see in the green is ResNet, which was pretty much the like golden standard of computer vision in terms of uh, neural nets for almost a decade. And it's being outperformed zero shot by clip, which means that without being trained on any of the classes that these other neural nets are trained to classify, zero shot clip is actually outperforming them on classification tasks. And clip even zero shot uh, performance is even better than few shot learning on clip itself, and so, as well as many other models. Few shot le learning meaning you give a couple examples of the of what you're trying to classify. So that means that this zero shot learning is incredibly powerful for classifying almost anything. All right, so now we get to the part that is uh, my research. 
So the question is, we wanted to create a way that we could take any input concept or problem domain and say, how, how can we automatically predict the accuracy that clip zero shot classification will have? So how, how can we say how well clip understands this concept? So to the point that we can do zero shot classification on it. So without having any labeled data, that's a huge headache because you don't actually have any data to work with. You don't know if, you know, this topic, let's say a dog on a surfboard, because there's no neural net right now, or there's no classifier that's specifically for dogs on surfboards. So the normal way to do that would be to compile a bunch of data and label it so that you can essentially do a few shot learning on it. But we want to be able to do it zero shot and with no labeled data. So how does this work? So the idea was that we would explore the internal consistency of clip space because we can make all of these, uh, all of the understanding of the geometry of clip space to make predictions. We're going to use the internal consistency of clip space to predict how well clip space understands the topic. So how do we do this? Well, we need to take any concept from a problem domain, introduce the text vectors, and introduce image vectors so that we have something in clip space to analyze. So we start with a problem input, like the warbler. Uh, and so that's going to plot a bunch of text vectors into clip space. Then we use Dolly. And Dolly is really important here because Dolly is actually a stable diffusion model that is guided by clip. So its understanding is also based on clip, meaning that what it essentially does is it takes a text input and can spit out a, an image that will live in clip space very close to where the text vector was. So it's a very good place to get you know, images that plot well on clip because Oh, I mean, assuming the image is a, is a good image, it should be in its correct place in clip, but Dolly can generate images that are really good. Uh, and so we generate those images. So we generate those images, and then essentially we now have image and text vectors. And what we need to do is understand and measure the the similarities because what we want to do is take the generated embeddings and and basically we're going to do cosine similarity on the difference between the text and image embeddings oops basically we're going to do yeah we're going to do cosine similarity between the difference between the text and image embeddings why because when you shift one of the image embeddings over into a certain direction, it signals that there is a change in the features of that item. You've changed from the orange crowned warbler to the Canada warbler. So that's, that is a real direction in 512 dimensions that has changed. If that change in direction of the vectors is consistent for both the images and the text, it means that Clip has a good understanding of it since the since the text and images are both shifted in the same places in the same ways. So that's how we came up with the architecture for our Will, it, Will Clip Zero Shot tool. So essentially what it can do is it can take any input class and then we go through the process of finding what the reasonable nearby alternatives to that class would be. So for example, this works so well because we're doing a bunch of different warblers. And by, by shifting things slightly from one warbler to another, we can measure in a much more accurate and smaller nearby clip space what, is, uh, what the changes are. And so we generate reasonable alternatives. And right now we're doing that using chat GPT um, because GPT is also trained on clip. And so it understands clip space pretty well. And it's generated alternatives are pretty reasonable, and we'll, we'll get into that in the demo. And so we take the image classes and we tokenize and encode them into clip. And then we take the same uh, classes and we use them as essentially a prompt in Dolly to generate images. And then we encode those images into clip as well. Then we do 
I, the little math blurb is essentially checking to see that these, checking to see how parallel these two vector differences are. And what we get out of it is essentially a score. And that score is not just how parallel these two lines are, but essentially how well Clip can zero shot this concept. Meaning that it knows the difference between a Canadian warbler and these other warblers. So the parallel I get, are you also doing the length? Like does the length? No, the length doesn't. The, the length of that vector doesn't make a huge difference. It's more so that it's pushing the direct the vectors in the correct directions, okay. which matters more in the high dimensional space. All right, so we're able to take any class, any input class, and essentially tell you how well it can zero shot. Does it work? And the reality is, what we found was, for the most part, it does work. And what you're seeing here are plots that plot how well our score did compared to how well uh, these classes actually uh, zero shot in terms of accuracy. So this is uh, so this is a bird data set. Uh, Stanford dogs is dogs. Flowers is a flowers. iNaturalist is a uh, nature images, mostly mammals. And uh, Resist is uh, like high up satellite images of large like structures, like a football stadium, for example, or uh, a dam. So what you're seeing here is there is a positive direct correlation, like linear correlation between the zero shot accuracy of any class and our prediction of whether or not zero shot will be good. So generally speaking, when these classes are not predicted to have good zero shot, our score is bad. And when it does, when a class does have good zero shot, it uh, it actually has a, a higher score. So that means that our score is working as we intended it to. What's interesting about it is the things that don't work well. And there's actually some very interesting outliers in our data. And that specifically would be uh, things that have a really good score and really low zero shot recall and things that have a really uh, good zero shot recall, but a terrible score. And why is that the case? So what you're seeing here are the pictures from the real data set over on the top row and pictures from the DALI data set, which were generated on the bottom row. And what you're seeing is we got really good uh, zero shot prediction or our score was really good for the generated images, but were not so good for the real images. And we couldn't figure out why until we looked at the outliers and found that we were trying to zero shot classify domestic sheep and our, our generated images of domestic sheep were great, but these actual data set images were of roadkill, feces, and just general landscape pictures. So the reason that they got such terrible scores compared to the generated images were because they were not good images, like of the actual thing you're trying to classify. And so it raises an interesting question of, can you take clip and say, oh, it seems to zero shot classify sheep really well. I can now go through this entire, uh, data set and actually label what is actually in these pictures. All you have to do is say whether or not Clip can understand what feces, roadkill, and sheep are. And it can actually reclassify all these images in a way that's much more convenient to real Clip classification. Another interesting thing that shows more of a failing of one of the models is these images, which show that they actually have really good um, zero shot recall. However, our generated images are have terrible prediction scores. And why is that? So if you look at the top row, the top row is the actual images of these flowers, whereas the bottom row is the generated images of the flowers. And as you can see, it's kind of just making arbitrary pretty flowers instead of the correct uh, flowers uh, that we're asking for, meaning that this looks like it's actually more of a failing of Dolly's training because we were not able to generate 
a flower that actually matched the concept, the text input concept. So if we can't generate good image data, then our prediction score will never work. So essentially, without an upgrade to Dolly that fixes the flowers, we can't say that we can zero shot these flowers, or we can't predict how well we can zero shot these flowers, rather. So it works on flowers and mammals and whatever, but does it work on a huge wide variety of things? To, to test whether or not this was the case, we tested our prediction scores on ImageNet. And so ImageNet is a large hierarchical data set of a really wide variety of different classes. So what we did was we took the hierarchy and we generated a group of images for every single node in this hierarchy. And then use the, uh, we essentially used the siblings of each node as the similar classes to then do zero shot prediction on all of them. And what we found was for the most part, Clip has a very good understanding of most of the features of all of these classes, with the exception of a few that it's actually very weak in. And you can see the difference. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why there might be difference. So for example, uh, if I look at, I think one of the greenest or best scores here is a lab code. And so that kind of feels like it makes sense because a lab coat has super consistent visual features. Like a lab coat, any picture you see of a lab coat is always looking pretty much the same. So it's actually something you might expect with zero shot very well versus something like a stole, which might not be in as much of the training data, first of all. And also stole is the past tense of steel, which could technically be seen as an ambiguous text vector, meaning it might conflicts with other things and other ideas in clip space, which causes it to be uh, slightly weaker. So why do you care? Why does it matter to have the ability to zero shot classify any subject? Well, when anyone is going to work on any AI project, they will want to know, okay, there's all these models. There's the clip model says that they can zero shot classify anything. Will it work for my topic? Will it work for the thing that I care about? And for the most part, we can use this tool that we've created to predict that for basically anything using any subjects and reasonable alternatives to that subject. So what you're seeing here is a, a tool, a screenshot from a tool that I've created that I'll demo at the end here. And all we asked it to do was say if it could zero shot classify a broken leg on an x-ray. And so what it does is it goes through the process here of generating the alternatives, encoding all of them, doing the math, and it spits out these alternatives with their images, and then tells us with a certain amount of certainty what the prediction is. And it predicted that it could recognize this broken leg on an x-ray picture versus these other three alternatives pretty well, 80% of the time. What does that mean? That means that if you wanted to, you could use this to classify broken legs on x-ray. And you could say with a 80% certainty that it should be able to work. So why do we care about that? It means that it could be used to essentially zero shot classify tons of different things that you might not be able to get the data for. So for example, content moderation is a big one. There are people whose jobs are to go through like Facebook and Instagram posts and they see like the most heinous stuff you can even imagine just to filter it out of the websites. If you could take a AI like Clip and say, all right, find all of the XYZ horrible thing that's not allowed on our platform and you could basically run a filter on all incoming pictures and automatically take things off your site or do any sort of content moderation based on zero shot classifying those things with Clip. So in order to make sure that would work, you would need to know how well Clip actually understands that space. So it would make sense that you would need a tool like this in content moderation, the medical space, for doing visual search engine SEO, meaning if you want to make a picture that is the most likely to be classified as a dog for your dog business, 
you can use this uh, for visual SEO purposes, as well as almost any AI proof of concept. So I'll give that example in my demo. So let's say you wanted to do a dog surfing website. You wanted to create a website that's just full of pictures of dogs on surfboards. You would need to come up with a way to scrape all the dog surfboard web, uh, pictures off the internet, but you don't know how to do that. And you can't do it manually, it'll take too long. So what you need to do is know how well Clip can understand what a dog on a surfboard is relative to other pictures that it's going to find. All right, so let's see how that works in real time. Am I still sharing? I'm still sharing the wrong screen now. Now let me share. Sorry. All right, so let's actually do zero shot classification on topic. So let's choose a dog on a surfboard. Okay, and so now, all right. And so now GPT has spit out some different alternatives. So as you can see, we're gonna get pictures of dog on a surfboard, cat on a hammock, rabbit on a skateboard, turtle on a beach ball, all sorts of stuff that, you know, might potentially be close by and confuse Clip. And we're gonna see how well it can actually understand the picture of a dog on a surfboard relative to these other alternatives. All right. And so what we get here are a bunch of wacky pictures and a dog on a surfboard. And it seems to, to say that it can recognize this dog on a surfboard 69% of the time over these other different alternatives. But what if you look at this and you say, okay, these alternatives are okay, but I'm not really worried about getting a cat in a hammock or a rabbit on a skateboard. I'm actually worried about getting different dogs. So you can actually just say, all right, well, instead, let me manually input some better alternatives. So let's say a dog on a skateboard, dog on a hammock. So let's just put dog on everything on a bicycle. All right, and so these become our new alternatives for checking. That way we know whether or not Clip can understand dog on a surfboard relative to our manual alternatives, which we think are better and more fine-grained. And so while this is loading, uh, it's worth mentioning that the next part of my research that I haven't finished yet is actually about how do we come up with these alternatives? What's the best way to come up with them? What are better ways to come up with them? And so now you can see that since we've narrowed it down to just dogs in different scenarios, it's less confident that it can predict this. So it's more of a 55%, which isn't amazing. However, it tells us that it's harder to differentiate dogs in different situations from each other versus the other animals doing different crazy whatever the hell things. All right. So uh, that is... I think it for my presentation. Uh, I'd like to obviously thank my advisor, Robert Pless, and Dr. Xiaotong Lu, who started this work, um, and then Grady and Yu Wu, who also contributed a great amount. But yeah, that's all my research. Any questions? So, presumably, if we had like really different alternatives, that score would get a lot higher. Like, if we put a person riding a bike, it would probably do very, very well. Yes, exactly. Because it's so distinctive. Yes. So where where in clip space the alternatives are, whether it be like a very close, you know, because like they kind of end up making like a circle around the main topic. So what directions you go and how far away you go in clip space does affect the score. Which is why I need to do more work into more fine grained control of the alternatives. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at one point how uh, you could we uh, could take some of those bad source pictures in the clip training set, uh, like in the sheep example, uh, and relabel them to improve clip's performance. Is that like a, something you can do? Like, can you like is that something that they let you like? Is 
Is that something that I could do, like download clip and be like, actually recategorize these as this, this, and this? You could essentially sure. use clip to relabel the images. And then when you're when you're giving it to any algorithm, you could just say, all right, you know, this is an image text pair. Here's the image, and the text is your new labeled data. So instead of here's an image of sheep feces, and we label it domestic sheep, you could have it be relabeled sheep feces and then see how it uh, how it actually zero shots. So create a new classifier essentially. And I actually did do this to show that it would work with um, a couple of pictures, one being feces and the other being uh, instead of a domestic sheep, it was the jawbone of a dead sheep. And so when I when I did zero shot classification of domestic sheep versus animal feces, it was 100% classified as animal feces. Well, we have that in the next version. Of yeah. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> and uh, it was like, it was also the jaw picture showed up as 100% an animal jawbone, not domestic sheep. So that means that, you know, Clip does have an idea of what these images are. And it just means they were the wrong subjects. And when you did the correct subject, it actually zero shot very highly. Mm -hmm. So is but like an open source, I mean, it's a neural So there is an open source like version of it, but yeah, it's owned by OpenAI. Okay. So this is about as open as OpenAI is open, <laughs> <laughs> which means no. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a neural network, basically. It's just a matrix. It's, of... it's, so it's not a neural network. It's actually uh, more transformer-based. OK. But yeah, the magic is in that giant matrix of the encoded images and, uh, and text. I, I'd be interested in seeing some sort of frontier or something. Instead of just telling me, compared to this set of images, I get one number, like 60%. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in seeing a hierarchy that's like, Here's a bucket of zero to ten. Here's a bucket of zero, ten to twenty. Here's ten, twenty to thirty, and just see all the different images. And so as you're getting closer, the images are going to get even more different, right? But yes. Like, then I would have a better sense of like where do things start to break down. So I just as and this is obviously a lot more computation. You have to basically right. run this in a giant loop. Mm -hmm. But it'd be really interesting to see where is the threshold for this topic, not just like how well does it compare against these, but give me the distribution of accuracy against a set of different things. And I can start to go, actually, looks like it doesn't really break down that that much until right about here, like images about this top. Right? So, right. And so you can break it down by the granularity of how different yeah. things are. So that's actually going to be the next state, the next phase of my research is understanding that granularity yeah, better. Okay. So I'll do what I'll do is multiple rounds, essentially, is I'll do this, which is round one of uh, different things and then I'll like get slightly more alternative yeah. classes and then slowly bring things in more and more and more. So the only challenge with doing that is understanding how to slightly change the semantic meaning of your text classifiers, which yeah. is kind of hard to do. <laughs> but what I'm working on. <laughs> because if I understood right, GPT is coming up with the alternative text. Right. And that's only so that you know, you could do it manually for everything, but it's just to automate that step of you manually inputting alternatives. So I can... So it's however you prompt GPT will determine... Yes, exactly. It however, It's basically however you prompt GPT. So right now, the version of alternative and generation is purely prompt engineering, which is... It's like kind of janky in my opinion. However, it works very well for literally any input, which is enough to make it a usable thing. In the picture of the flowers, you mentioned that um, it was indicating that Dolly might have some bad training cells. Yeah. Um, is that a use case for this? Can you um, use it to detect where Dolly or other generators might have bias or Yes. Problems? So essentially, it did do that, right? Essentially, for both examples of the weird outliers, we both found that we had poorly labeled data in our data set which we identified using the tool. And we also identified that Dolly cannot generate images of certain flowers because it doesn't know how to. And we found that using the outliers as well. Um, and yeah, we, we basically could run, we probably, if we looked deeper into the ImageNet experiment, 
that uh, that plotted all sorts of different labels all over the place, we would have found more interesting outliers like that. Uh, that being said, there's a little more nuance to it. For example, there are things that are just harder to zero shot because they are ambiguous, such as try generating an image of a bat. You might get a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. You might get an animal bat. You know, so if you don't specify, and that's another reason why uh, using the image at hierarchy is so useful, because you can generate an image of a bat, but you can contextualize it with the parent of it. So if you are, if the parent of bat is baseball, then you know what you're actually generating a picture of because it contextualizes it for you. You need a baseball bat. If the parent of bat was mammal, though, then you would understand that it's the animal. So that just means that you need to get around the ambiguous text vectors in order to actually do this accurately. I think that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> Guess ask the people online too if they have questions. Yeah, people on Zoom. Anyone? You may have to turn on someone's speaker. That's yeah, my audio is off, but this should be on. I don't see anyone unmuting anyway. All right. Oh, no, wait. Is Zane saying something? Oh, <laughs> okay. This is very informative. Thank you. I, I don't have any questions right now, but probably later. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'll see you around, man. <laughs> we do, yeah, do work in the same yeah first place, though. Of course. Yeah. I'm fine either. So, what am I talking? Yeah, I'm fine as well. So, <laughs> I don't have questions. Very, very good presentation. Awesome, though. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm. I'm also trying to think about the historical, like.